Um, our next speaker is Kevin Esvelt. He's come from the MIT Media Lab where he runs the Sculpting Evolution group there. Um, he has a very intriguing title, um, which is Open, Local, and Obligated. All right. So first of all, as an evolutionary engineer and biotechnologist, it is my business to make pigs fly. <laughs> and we have been approaching this problem from a perspective of that attempting to ensure that the FDA or any other federal regulatory authority or really anyone involved in politics whatsoever, an attempt to get the existing legal system to give some kind of public acceptance and support and validity of what you're doing is frankly a fool's errand. That is. You have to abide by the regulations because they are there, they are legal, you must comply with them, but you should never go to the FDA and rely on its evaluation process to win you public support for your projects. That is just not how this works. But I'm also not particularly interested in any particular biotechnology product. That is, I'm interested in changing the culture of how we do science in these areas. And not so much just because I'm frankly, because I'm all that concerned about particular marginalized groups and hearing voices and so on, but because technology is becoming increasingly powerful and we are not necessarily wise enough to use it in every case. So I don't trust myself to make a wise decision with any of the technologies that we develop, which is why we go and ask other people, everyone. So open and responsive science is especially important, of course, in any project that seeks to alter the common environment. Because we all share the common environment, and that means that we need to at least tell other people what we are thinking of doing before we even begin experiments. So this is difficult, right? Because every incentive in science points against it. If you share your brilliant idea, you are basically inviting some larger, better funded lab with spare hands to c come in, steal it, get it working first with their extra money and manpower advantage, publish, and then they get 100% of the credit and you get none. That is a cultural problem, an institutional problem that we need to change. Because if you don't tell people what you're doing in advance, you're not actively inviting concerns and criticism at a time that could be meaningful in terms of changing how the project works. Gene drive is a particular concern of mine, not only because of a certain moral responsibility when it comes to the CRISPR-based form, but because with a gene drive system, at least the self-sustaining invasive kind that can spread forever, if you even decide to build one of the, these in the laboratory, you are running the risk that it will fly out the window. And if it does, it will start to spread. At least if you're foolish enough to run it in a when your laboratory is within the endemic range of the target species, which no one should ever do, but people do. And your decision to even go ahead and build that in the lab means that you are performing an experiment that could affect other people. And if you don't tell them that you're doing that in advance, you are actively denying them a voice in a decision that could affect them. And frankly, that's wrong. So we have to change the incentives. And there's only so much you can do in terms of changing how industry does things. It's possible primarily through changing cultural attitudes and beliefs, but really I'm most concerned about academics. And that's because academics really don't appreciate public input, most of us. We tend towards, shall we say, liking to retreat into our caves or our gorgeous ivory towers, as the case may be, and pursuing our own pet projects and systems, independent of all that blather and us out there that's known as politics. For very good reasons, because politics is the mind killer. If what you care about is the intellectual life of the mind, you want to stay as far away from anything political as possible. But the reality is if what you want to do is change the world, then there is no choice but to engage in politics. And so what we need to do if we want to make academics actively share their plans before they perform the experiments, even in a small subfield such as gene drive, we have to get the journals, for example, to require experimental pre-registration in order to eventually publish your work. If, you get, if we get the leading journals to say, no, we will not publish your work unless you pre-registered it on, in one of these venues, the experiments that you're going to perform, the safeguards you're going to use, then we won't publish it. Then watch all the academics jump to pre-register. 
Same deal with the funders. We'll give you money to perform the experiments, but only if you're open with them. Well, then we're going to be open. And it's not that most scientists, and I've talked to for essentially everyone in the gene drive field, it's not that anyone objects to being open, it's just we're all afraid of being scooped. And that, but if we can require everyone to do the right thing, then that fear basically goes away. It's a collective action problem. It's everyone or no one, for the most part, with some exceptions. The last one we're actually looking at is intellectual property, which is probably not typically considered the friend of most people who are concerned with the public interest and the like. P was originally, was originally um, <coughs> conceived to ensure that the work was made open so that others could build on it. But of course, you can't actually get anything useful out of a patent. They're actually written to avoid that. But why not use intellectual property to require openness in terms of experiments and gene drive. That's what we're looking for. Can we create a patent pool using our CRISPR gene drive patents and possibly other relevant patents that would only give research licenses to institutions that pledge to make all of their research open from before they perform those experiments? And because my group is at the Media Lab, where we don't exactly suffer from the same incentives governing everyone else, we started to just go ahead and pre-register all of our experiments involving gene drive. We just write up an article exactly as, as we would for a journal publication, and we post a preprint on BioArchive, just like we normally do. But we do it before we run the experiments, and just detail what we're planning to do and what the safeguards are. We also have a project that doesn't involve gene drive, where we're still obeying many of these same rules. Um, the idea is, around here, Tick-borne disease is a serious problem. It's something that people care about. It's one of those things, if you talk to the typical person on the street, they will know somebody who has been afflicted in this area. And it's something that people would like more solutions for. So this is an area where biotechnology might actually be worthwhile. Engineered salmon, maybe not. Tick-borne disease, yes. So it's worst on the islands of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And our idea is, since most ticks are infected by white-footed mice, if we could immunize the mice, then you would break the cycle of transmission. Ticks would no longer be infected. People wouldn't get disease. And we can immunize mice without actually using any foreign DNA. This is totally and completely 100% irrelevant from a scientific standpoint. There is natural gene flow between all wild populations. The notion of a species is a totally confabulated concept that, is, that we adopt even in science just because we like to put things in mental boxes. All sweet potatoes are GMOs. The cow genome is 25% snake. But all of that is immaterial because people out there, citizens in these communities, they care. And so if they don't want foreign genes in their mice, then we won't put foreign genes in their mice because they're the ones in control. They're the ones who live there. What's more, this is an example of trying to make the smallest possible change that will solve the problem. Now you might say, how on earth is engineering an entire wild population of white-footed mice the smallest possible change? that could solve the problem. Well, the way we're doing it is we're taking the adaptive immune response, the evolved antibodies that some mice evolve when we expose them to the pathogen, taking those antibody encoding genes, pulling out the most protective ones, and inserting those into the mouse genome so that future generations of mice can inherit them. So the mi mice also have a, a genome size. We just had them, had them sequenced in the billions. So we're introducing 10,000 bases of DNA that came from another mouse into all the mice. That's a pretty tiny change on the scale of, say, spraying a caricides to kill the ticks, which also kill all sorts of other things. In fact, that might actually be the smallest possible change. And the reason why we're working with the islands is because anytime you're engineering any complex system, doesn't matter what it is, you can't always predict all the side effects. You start small, you see what happens, and you scale up if warranted. So we're starting with a uninhabited island, again, only if the communities of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, which now have steering committees in charge of the project, want us to go forwards, then we will release mice on a small island, perhaps a thousand or so mice that has a population of a thousand or so native mice, and through standard mixing, no gene drive, the native mice will take up the genes. They will otherwise be genomically matched. So the only difference will be those mouse antibodies, and then we'll see what happens. And if an independent assessment committee like says this looks good and the communities vote and decide to proceed, then possibly you might see mice on Nantucket in the vineyard, but albeit not until 2024. So this is the other thing. As I mentioned, the 
Islanders have steering committees now that are actually in charge of the project, not us. We actually requested community guidance before we did any research experiments, funding, funding requests, anything. And we have a data safety monitoring board that's being assembled that will do all the independent assessment because just as you should never entrust the person who proposed the hypothesis to test it, which may be perhaps a reform we should try in science sometime, you really don't want the people who developed the technology to be doing the assessment of whether or not it works. And again, this would be also independent of FDA or anything like that, although the data would, of course, be submitted to them too. And we have been working, um, we have did consult with the FDA and Fish and Wildlife before beginning this project because you need them on the same page. We have to jump through those hoops, but those are hoops. And the point is the community is in control. And we're, again, we're starting local and we're going to scale up only if the community wishes. And this is what I'd like to see for all projects of this type. Pick something that people definitely want to see. Don't even bother introducing a new technology unless there is a really obvious benefit that is obvious to everyone, which by the way means no agriculture, <laughs> ever. You should never, ever, ever introduce a new technology in the area of agriculture because it's invisible to most people. Here's the problem with, with these rules. Start local, well, Jim showed you the animation last night. This thing self-scales. You cannot run a field trial. You cannot introduce it anywhere in the endemic environment without having it spread probably to every population. And if it wouldn't do it naturally, well, people will move it. How many trolls are there on the internet? Lots. More than enough to move a few mice or mosquitoes or anything else. And if there's economic reason to do so, they will. Australia loves engineering viruses to wipe out their cute bunny rabbits. <laughs> New Zealand decided that when the Khaleesi virus got out of control in Australia, they didn't want it in New Zealand. New Zealand farmers smuggled it in anyway, through the tightest biocontrol restrictions in the world. Do you think you can stop that? Just because it's a gene drive? Not going to happen. So we just can't do this. Like malaria, maybe. That might be a big enough problem that it would be worth that all, enough African countries could all, all decide to come together and agree they want to do it, maybe even without a field trial. But for any lesser problem, it's just not going to happen, which means we need local gene drive systems. We don't need these for the white-footed mice because there are few enough mice on Nantucket in the vineyard. That is, it's feasible to grow up and release 100,000 engineered mice. It's not feasible to do more than that. So we need some form of amplification effect, but we don't want it to spread forever. So my group is developing daisy drive systems that could do this. And the basic idea is, for the simpler version, it's called the daisy field, is that you split up the components of the drive system. So you have, these are the targeting instructions telling the drive system where to cut. This is the CRISPR nuclease that does the cutting. This is the cargo gene you want to spread. As long as you have at least one genetic element telling it to cut here, then it will convert the organism from a heterozygote at this locus to a homozygote. But there's nothing causing these to drive, meaning that drive only occurs as long as you still have some. And those are diluted out. So if you start with an organism that has, say, four copies, made it to wild type, on average, the offspring are going to have two. Made it to wild type again, those offspring are going to have one. All the offspring of that mating are still going to inherit your cargo, but these guys are now out of extra targeting elements. So you don't see drive anymore. It just stops. Literally, it just runs out of genetic fuel and stops. But depending on how many copies you put in, then you can get an amplification effect so you can release comparatively few organisms and affect a broader population. But even that is not good enough. Because like it or not, we humans do compartmentalize things in boxes, and we do these things called draw political boundaries. And so you can imagine that one community might decide they want to, say, immunize their local mouse population here, and the neighboring community will not. What if New Haven wants to and Hartford doesn't? You're going to just tell the mice to not cross the boundary? Well, we can to some extent do that, we believe, by, by essentially making the gene drive democratic, which seems to be a popular word around here. How do you have a gene vote in a quorum? Well, if you do some clever tricks where you're swapping absolutely essential genes where you need two copies, and then they're swapped in position, meaning that when you have a mating event, there's a 50% chance of inheriting either one. That means that anyone who inherits only one copy, essentially one swapped and one wild type, they're toast. In other words, it's bad to be a hybrid of engineered 
and wild. And what that means is, in an engineered population, it actually favors the engineered alleles because then you're mostly mating with other engineered alleles and so all of their offspring are fine. In the wild type, similarly, it's better to mate with wild type because then all your offspring are fine. But it penalizes anything that does the mixing. And so the daisy quorum effect, in effect, ensures that this turns on only after you run out of daisy elements. So in other words, you introduce your daisy organisms in the environment, it spreads your alteration through the target population. As soon as it runs out of daisy elements, it becomes bad to mate with wild type. And so you basically block gene flow between the engineered and wild populations, thereby confining it to the city that wants it and keeping it out of the city that doesn't. Highly theoretical, pie in the sky, except this is entirely based on CRISPR, and CRISPR is magic. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, what we really hope to do, given that sooner or later someone is going to screw up involving probably fruit flies and release a highly invasive gene drive system that's going to spread around the world and cause disastrous headlines, scientists accidentally convert entire wild population, well, entire species to GMOs, is CRISPR to blame? Like that headline will come someday. There is no stopping it. The best defense is to ensure that we have an open, local, community-driven application that everybody wants first. Otherwise, if you think the whole we're in, thanks to how agribiotech has been conducted to date, is deep, just wait. The other way to defend is to come up with a technological way of restoring any engineered population to wild type. That is to say, it doesn't matter if somebody screws up. You are going to have genetic vandalism into wild populations. We have to be able to fix it. And one of the neat things about Daisy Quorum is that it lets you do something wherein, supposing someone does screw up and releases even an invasive global gene drive system, you drop in a few Daisy Quorums engineered so that it spreads like a, like a self-sustaining drive using the, only in the presence of the rogue nuclease. It will overwrite all copies, switch over to Daisy in the wild type. You end up with this population that's all engineered with the Daisy Quorum. So you're blocking gene flow, further gene flow between here and out. Then if you just drop in enough wild types so these are now in the minority, or use CRISPR suppression to suppress all of the organism, engineered organisms that have CRISPR, as soon as these guys are back in the minority, the quorum wipes them out. That is, every engineered gene is gone because every engineered gene in that population has become linked to the quorum effect. And the quorum effect says that if you're in the minority, then you're outvoted and you're going away. So the entire population returns to wild type, no matter what the engineered gene is. And that's, the, and that's our goal for this. Restore any, at least drive amenable, engineered population to wild type, no matter what anybody else did with it. That means there's lots of different things that we could potentially do if we can actually efficiently alter a specific local wild population within a consenting community without affecting any others mainly health, animal welfare, environment, and agriculture. And again, this must not come first. But these others are interesting. And this is an extension of the original Venn diagram I drew in our eLife paper describing CRISPR gene drive. That one didn't have animal welfare, but it's one that I've been thinking about a lot more. And I decided to put it opposite environment because there's gonna be an interesting moral tension that we're going to have to face. That is, are we obligated to intervene? Peter Singer's famous drowning child example says, well, if you're willing to jump into a, a lake to save a drowning child and thereby ruining your shoes and suit, then why aren't you willing to give a corresponding amount of money to save a child on the other side of the world? Well, I would say this is an interesting case because if you have a, the child's in a deep lake, you are responsible for jumping in and saving the child. I think most people would agree. You don't have to have pushed the child in, but if you're the one who could save them, then you are obligated to do so. But only if you already know how to swim. No one would ask you to probably throw away your life and also fail to save the child. If you don't know how to swim, we don't expect you to jump in a deep, deep lake to save a drowning child. Well, here's the thing. Right now, animals are suffering in nature. And with these technologies, we are actively learning how to swim. We didn't make those animals suffer. That's just how evolution works. Evolution has no moral compass. Evolution doesn't care. Nature is not immoral, but it is amoral. But we are moral creatures, and as soon as we gain the power to intervene, the power to do something about it, 
then we are morally responsible whatever decision we make. That is to say, we are going to have to face the fact that animal welfare concerns are going to oppose those of a sacredness of nature concerns. They are in direct opposition. You cannot simultaneously have a completely wild, pristine population of organisms and the absence of animal suffering because that's inherent to it. So what are we gonna do? In some cases, it's pretty egregious. This is, a, this is the key deer in the Florida Keys. There was recently an outbreak of New World screw worm, which we had previously pushed all the way down to South America using sterile insect technique. There's about 1,000 of these deer, and, about, and as of October, 83 of them had died of screw worm. This is commonly considered to be one of the most excruciatingly agonizing afflictions ever known, because it does, in fact, afflict people. If you have something as small as a tick bite, then a screw worm fly can get in there and lay its eggs, and they will eat their way out, and they like nervous tissue in particular. This organism cannot but live, save through causing horrific agony to higher mammals. That is, those organisms that we deem to have what the closest, be, closest to being conscious and the greatest ability to suffer pain. What are we going to do? Because this is a species that we could, if we wanted to, it's only now in South America and occasionally invades back. We could remove it from the wild entirely and, in, and only propagate it so that it does not go extinct in a laboratory on already killed animals, if we wanted to. If we don't, then the agony of every animal infested with screw worm flies is on our heads. So, it's our responsibility. What are we gonna do? Thanks to my group in particular for taking risks because again, I'm at the Media Lab. The incentives are different for me, but their careers really are on the line. So they're the true heroes for agreeing to join and make all of their best ideas open. And to all of our collaborators for work that, okay, to be fair, most of which was not actually presented in this presentation. <laughs> and thank you for your attention.